This week's episode of EWA Radio is sponsored by South by Southwest EDU. EWA retains full editorial control over the contents of this podcast. This is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to 2024. We're going to pull out the crystal ball and do some prognosticating. And joining me to help forecast the biggest stories ahead on the beat are two veteran journalists, Melissa Tabuada, the education editor for the Boston Globe, and John Marcus, higher education editor for the Heckinger Report. Melissa, welcome to your EWA Radio debut. Thank you so much, and Happy New Year to you. Thank you. And John, always a pleasure to have you join us. Thanks very much for having me. So I tossed a coin and I will have to tell you that K-12 won to go first. But as in the Rose Bowl, I expect higher education to come roaring back in the second half of today's episode. So John, I'm going to ask you to hold tight. No problem. Melissa, we're going to start with you. I'd ask you to come up with a few story ideas for reporters to have in mind for the new year. Why did migrant students top your list? You know, they've been in the news quite a bit for the last couple of years, just the influx of migrants that have been coming to the U.S., but I don't think that we have really done a great job examining their lives and their experiences within schools and education um, from both sides, you know, how districts are grappling with the influx of these students in classrooms, how they're providing translators, what kind of policies they're putting in place around them but also the students' experiences. To me, it's just the most telling stories of these children who are coming over. Um, Obviously, most aren't coming on their own volition. They're coming with their families, with their parents, and they're going through quite a bit of trauma. And so just really wanting to examine their experiences and, and how they're learning and how they're coping um, with being in a new country, maybe the first time they're having formalized education, just really important. And honestly, my mom um, was a migrant student herself and coming from Mexico and did not have a great experience coming to the U.S. So that's always at the top of my mind. Well, it's obviously a really important issue, but I think you did hit on that word, which is kind of the word of 2024 in a lot of ways, and that is trauma, which is this idea that students are coming not just with potential academic deficits, at least when it comes to learning and and speaking in the English language, but with this trauma and the shortage of things like school guidance counselors or school psychologists for students who are already struggling and still struggling with the fallout of the pandemic, and now you have these newcomers. Yeah, definitely. Um, You know, there's going to be a need for a lot of supports for them. You know, their physical needs, language needs, you know, just often living in poverty when when they're coming um, to the states. And so the school districts just have a lot of work cut out for them and just being able to help provide for those needs, those basic needs, before we can even get to the place of educating these kids. And not just that, but just the political rhetoric around it, uh, people's strong feelings about migrants in schools, whether they should be educated in the U.S. And I I think that they also feel a lot of that. um, They're carrying a lot of that trauma too, not just from their experiences coming over, but from trauma that they're experiencing here in schools and from the political climate. If a reporter brought this story to you, obviously you as an editor don't need convincing. What tips do you have for a reporter who may want to bring this topic to their editor and the editor may push back and say, hey, you're talking about a very small population of students in the big picture. Why are our readers going to care? I don't think it's as small as we might think it is. I think it's affecting every state and it changes the dynamics of how students are learning in school. Some Districts, you know, will have them separate in separate classrooms and then they don't ever integrate them while other districts say, hey, it's going to be English full immersion. You're in all the way. We might provide you some translation services, but you're going to have to just jump in on the deep end. And that affects all kids. It's not just the migrant students who are being affected. It's their classmates. It's the students that they're learning 
um, alongside. And so I would pitch that to an editor that it's a bigger story than just a, a smaller group of, of students. And it has um, ramifications going forward on your enrollment, on the amount of money districts have to spend on the students and being able to provide these extra support services in hiring more bilingual teachers, translators, materials, educational materials um, that are made in those languages, in different languages. Your second story that you wanted to discuss is one that we as education journalists, I feel like we talked about it for most of 2023, but it still feels like the alarm bells aren't ringing loudly enough. Talk to us about the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, better known as ESSER. What are your concerns there? You know, in the words of Jon Snow, winter is coming and that Esther Cliff is just about here. And we really need to examine. We've been saying, OK, the, the funds are running out. They're going to be running out. Some school districts have been better than others in preparing for that drying up the funds. But what is going to happen to these kids once money runs out? I mean, we know that jobs are at stake. We know a lot of the supports that they put in place with this money, mental health supports, hiring more counselors, high dosage tutoring, all of those things may be wiped out overnight if the planning wasn't done well. And so I think that we need to be examining the kids after this. And once the supports go away, how are these kids going to fare? I don't think that we can divorce this subject from pandemic learning losses, I think they're going to have to be closely tied together because once these financial supports are no longer in place, there will be a question of, are these kids going to regress even further than they have been? They haven't been doing well to date. Maybe there have been some gains in some areas, but we know that they're still struggling both academically and mentally. So, you know, once these funds are gone, how are these kids going to fare? And so I, I just think that we can go a lot deeper on this. You know, how are the districts going to manage? Are they searching for any kind of replacement funds? What are kids going to be missing out going forward? I wanted to make some kind of quip or, or joke about how some districts have been shoring up their northern walls and others are blowing it on dragon eggs. But we can't even really joke about this, right? I mean, this is a critical pressure point. And I, I do think one challenge for reporters is going to be how much transparency there's been around where those dollars have gone. The Every Student Succeeds Act requires districts to disclose where some of these funds are being spent. But I'm not even sure that we're getting all the numbers. I would agree with that. I think it has not been as transparent as it needs to be. The outlines of their plans may be just that, outlines and not a dollar for dollar accounting of how they've been spending their money. And I think as journalists, we need to be putting in a lot of FOIAs into the individual districts, into the states, um, state education agencies, finding out, okay, here's the end of the funds. What's the reckoning? How have you spent every dime of these funds? And it may be that some districts didn't do very well at planning at all, and that funding was wasted. They didn't spend as much of it as they were supposed to, while others rushed to spend it, and they already started having layoffs before the last you know, money should have been available to them. And I'm just going to repeat a, a warning that we've been given all through 2023 and, and talking about these funds, and that is to reporters to double check things like context and double check things like drawdown accounts. So just because a district hasn't drawn down the money, it doesn't mean that they haven't necessarily decided where those dollars are going to be spent. That's warning number one. And number two, keep things in context. Don't rush for a headline about a district buying a new athletic field until you find out that that district hasn't redone its field since 1978, and that field is going to serve as a, an important community center in what might be a small rural town. So remember, keep those numbers in context. Melissa, your third story I want to talk about, and it's a great one, and it's obviously we've got to talk about Gen Z, and that is the idea of how students themselves are responding to this politically charged world we're living in and how that's factoring into how they use their voices. Tell us more about that. Yeah, you know, just taking a look at 
continued student activism. We saw, especially in 2018, after the mass school shooting in Parkland, high school students, middle school students started organizing in really big ways. They created organizations like March for Our Lives and Students Demand Action. And all of that was around gun legislation. Um, They've been successful to certain extents in, in helping pass legislation in some states. But just even here recently, in recent weeks with the Israel-Hamas war, we've seen it again, not just on college campuses and and college students protesting and rallying, but we've seen it at high school campuses and middle school campuses where students are walking out. And so to your point about Gen Z students, you know, they very much are very centered on social justice issues and care passionately about that. And so there's sort of this cross between giving students the rights to do that, to walk out, to voice their opinions and their free speech. But at the same time, um, school districts grappling with how do we keep students in school? How do we talk about these kind of issues in responsible ways that allow students to have voice and how much should they be affording to give minors that kind of free voice within public school walls. We're talking with education editors John Marcus and Melissa Tabuato about the big stories to watch in 2024. This episode of EWA Radio is sponsored by South by Southwest EDU. Join them March 4th through 7th in Austin, Texas, as they tackle the world's most critical social issues through the lens of education. Experience community-driven programming, unparalleled networking opportunities, and unexpected discoveries. Visit South by Southwest EDU to discover hundreds of sessions and events already revealed featuring inspiring thought leaders in education. Register today. John, let's continue with you on some higher education questions. You know, when I asked you to prepare some story ideas, you let me know that pairing back your list was going to be tough, and I appreciate your efforts to triage. So let's get into it. What's number one on your list? Yeah, this was a tough assignment, uh, limiting this list to three. So this is by no means lessens the significance of topics that we've already been covering in 2023, like admissions in the wake of the affirmative action decision. That will be a huge story this year as we begin to see the ramifications of that actually in real time. Uh, The bumbling of the FAFSA form, AI, those all are and will remain very important issues. This year is going to be a crazy ride on this beat, which I guess is great job security for us. And it's such a moving target But at this moment, I think these topics are really going to be preeminent this year. The first one, and I might not have predicted this a few weeks ago, is the culture wars, which have regained momentum when on the very first business day of the new year, unsurprisingly, the president of Harvard resigned. Conservative critics haven't been shy about sharing their playbook for continuing to attack colleges and universities over speech and other issues. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. I think our coverage would do well to kind of focus on the kind of mind-boggling tone deafness that has been displayed by these most elite universities, the smartest people in the world, who just have walked right into this and won't defend themselves. And uh, higher education journalism colleagues, in the wake of the resignation of Kleining Gay at Harvard, reached out to other college and university presidents, universally wouldn't talk universally don't want to address this. They don't want to be the next lightning rod. They don't know what to do. And that's going to be a fascinating topic to watch this year. When I think about it, and I think about in terms of, you know, like a GIF on social media, I see that armadillo just flipping on his back and tucking up his shell into this tight little ball. And I think it's going to be a really scary time to be a college president. Absolutely. And the presidential election also, once again, is going to amplify these culture wars. Interestingly, at the state level, where a lot of the really damaging stuff is happening anyway and has been for a while, I think that this is an election year, but there's likely to be very little change in control of states. There are very few genuinely contested gubernatorial races, and it's unlikely that many legislatures will change from one party to another. So we can expect to continue to see legislative action affecting largely public universities around DEI, critical race theory, other curricular issues. It isn't going away. 
And similar to Melissa's warnings about the ESSER funding, there's another kind of cliff looming for higher education, and it's one that's been nearly two decades in the making. Why don't you tell us about that? Yes, winter is coming also to higher education, and that is the enrollment picture. We're now two years away from the demographic cliff, which hits in 2026. And so if you think things are bad now on the enrollment front, just wait until then. Why is 2026 the year? Because people stop having children during recessions. And the last recession was in 2008. So you add 18 years to that. And by 2026, we start running out of 18-year-olds. That's always been predictable, which doesn't mean that higher education ever plans for it. They don't seem to plan for anything. But the predictable demographic decline comes on top of the enrollment decline over the last 10 years that has already been made worse by a number of things, including huge public skepticism about the value of higher education, which has finally come home to roost. So I will say I was thinking about this conversation, and I I know that many people, including journalists, have for years said this is going to be the year that all these colleges close. And to be honest, we were usually wrong. Colleges somehow continued to survive. Last year, 2023, we were right. On average, the equivalent of a college closed every month in 2023. That's staggering. And that's only going to speed up. Uh, And this time, I'm pretty confident of that prediction. There are a lot of stories under this umbrella, including the drop off of rural enrollment. A disproportionate number of colleges that have closed have been in rural America, where there's already very low college going, very high high school graduation rates, very low college going. And another story here that kind of connects to the culture wars and your armadillo metaphor is why has the higher education industry done almost nothing to counter the public perception that there's no longer a return on investment? They do have a story to tell, but they can't seem to get their act together to tell it. And if you look at other industries that have been threatened, like them or not, fossil fuel industry, the tobacco industry, they managed to collectively try to change the message. Higher education hasn't done that. That's kind of staggering. So when you think about what's coming in two years, Depending on what source you use, there'll be another drop after 2026 of between 11 to 15% decline in the number of students. That's on top of a 13% decline in the last 10 years. There are 2.6 million fewer college students. That's crazy. And any hope of a rebound is fading because not only do people not have children during recessions, apparently they don't have them during pandemics either. I wrote a story about this, which gave me the rare opportunity as an education writer to statistically uh, report how often or not people were having sex. doesn't come up very often in, on the education beat. What a shame. Um, the, <laughs> I know the number of births actually continued to decline during the pandemic because people weren't having sex, uh, which is kind of surprising because there wasn't anything else to do. But anyway, um, they were down by another 142,000 births to the lowest point since 1979. So that means that any hope of a rebound from this demographic decline, which colleges always sort of cling to hope beyond reason, there's no hope that this is going to reverse, not for a long time. Your next story is a big one. It overlaps what we've just been discussing, and it's tied to that familiar question, why college? Is college worth the investment? Who should go to college? Why are you expecting this debate to take on some fresh oxygen in 2024? Yeah, I think, well, it's not as much that it's going to take on fresh oxygen, but I think we should feed oxygen to it as people who cover this topic. This is a really important question that we need to raise as higher education journalists. And that is, what is the impact of people not going to college? And I want to stop and say very clearly, because everyone gets in trouble whenever they're assumed to be suggesting that everyone needs to go to college, that not everyone needs to go to college, but someone needs to go to college. And when you're looking at 2.6 million fewer students in the last 10 years, and uh, at least that many fewer in the next 10, that's a big problem. It's a big problem for economic growth. People without education past high school, they earn significantly less. They're more likely to live in poverty. They're less likely to be employed. They're more vulnerable to economic downturns. They're more prone to depression. They live from five to 12 years less than people who have college degrees, life expectancy has increased for people that went to college, but it's declined for those who didn't. So all of these things end up having an enormous practical impact, tangible impact on society and the economy, even as our economic rivals are increasing the proportion of the population that's going to college 
and has degrees. Here it's falling. And that means more of these people in the categories that require social services, they make less money, so they pay fewer taxes, but they're more likely to require Medicaid and food stamps and other social services. That puts a drag in the economy. That compounds the existing drag in the economy from the aging of the population. We're in trouble and nobody's paying attention to that. So I think we as higher education journalists need to continue to bring people's attention to this. Before I let you both go, Melissa, you had a story that works for both K-12 and higher ed, and it was around artificial intelligence, AI. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I just think that we should be, you know, examining not just the ethics of it, but how it's going to be fitting into everyday student life, whether that's high school students or college students. I really do see that it is a crossover. You see kind of a slow embrace of it now when before colleges and and high schools were clamping down saying, no, you can't use this to, okay, we're creating some policies around it, to right now we are actually implementing it into what we're doing, what we're teaching, what we're learning. So I just, you know, kind of want to look at whether any of the safeguards that they were putting in place at colleges helped, how are college admissions counselors grappling with an increase in applications that have used AI? What do they do with those applications if they're flagging them? And are there any real ways to flag whether AI has been used since, you know, the company that was behind um, chat GPT? I, I guess it was sometime last year. I'm not sure if this is still the case, but they got rid of their tool that could detect it because it was also detecting real human responses as AI. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of different angles that you can examine both in that high school and higher ed field. I imagine that's on your radar too, John. Yeah, I agree that AI raises a lot of threats, including those that Melissa has outlined. I think it also has some potential. If you look at higher education in terms of admission and academics, yes, there are issues there around students using AI to write their admissions essays and do their homework. But if you look at the administrative side of colleges and universities, there's a lot that AI can do that right now a lot of very highly paid administrators are paid to do. And AI has been used successfully in a lot of university settings to provide some basic advising to let a student know whether he or she is on or off track in ways that I think is very effective or to answer really simple questions so as not to tie up uh, an administrator, an advisor, a faculty member, or a teaching assistant. So I think there's a lot of potential there to use it in a positive way. Will colleges and universities do that? I'm not optimistic as someone that's covered them for a long time. Even if they do see something as a potential cost saving, they end up adding it without subtracting anything to counteract it. But I teach as an adjunct and I see layers of technology in my classroom, like archaeology of of expensive technology that higher education buys, adds, and then replaces. So I'm not sure where we are on AI, but I do think that it can be used for good. And just to wrap up quickly, John, you had a K-12 story idea. What is it? Yeah, we've been covering over the last year at every level in education, the impact of curriculum changes mandated by legislatures. These have been kind of general at the higher education level. People have passed some laws that restrict DEI and critical race theory. Mostly the impact has been people have changed the way they teach out of fear. The legislation is purposely vague and really hard to interpret whether it actually says what its sponsors suggest that it says seems less important than the fact that faculty and administrators at universities assume that it does. As an observer, I'm interested on, at what's happening at the K-12 level where these changes seem more immediate and dramatic, these curricular changes mandated by legislatures. When we'll begin to see the results of this pushback against teaching about or even acknowledging historical truths such as slavery, how it will manifest itself, and how will we even measure it? It's really scary and kind of cries out for being closely covered. When will we know whether we're raising a generation of people who don't understand their history in ways that it's important that they do? Melissa, I imagine this is something that the Boston Globe is thinking about and talking about. 
Yeah, it is. And it is a terrifying question. Um, just even with the AP changes, we have already started covering the pilot AP class and what changes have been made there and what teachers are doing on the ground, supplemental books that they may be providing to their students, other things that they can be teaching in their curriculum so that students aren't completely in the dark. But there may be other states where the laws are much stricter and things get pulled completely. And, you know, I just would hope that students could also do some learning on their own, that parents would come in and help provide their kids with supplemental materials. But being that there's also issues at libraries with book bans, it is a scary scenario to be in. Um, Some education advocates are really pushing for changes to literacy curriculum, for example. And um, that could, you know, result in some good things. But yeah, those changes, I think we're going to just be seeing immediately, you know, within this next year or two. We've had a lot of talk about terrifying, scary cliffs, Game of Thrones season eight. Just to end on an up note, if we can, John, what's something you're looking forward to in 2024? That's the hardest question of the day. Um, I am looking forward to continuing the what I've seen of the the deserved scrutiny that higher education has been getting after a long period of not really being covered. I mean, I'm talking like in the 1990s and early 2000s, not really being covered with the kind of scrutiny that other institutions got. I think we're at a stage now where higher education and its value proposition are being covered in ways that less assume that higher education is on some kind of moral high ground and understand it to be a human institution, just like any other human institution, if not in some cases, frankly, worse. Melissa, how about you? Something you're looking forward to in 2024? Um, A vacation. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, I mean, I am really excited. This year is the 50th anniversary of the big Garrity decision, which prompted desegregation in Boston schools. And so I am looking forward to delving into that and examining how it affected the lives of kids then and now. Melissa Taboada is the editor of The Globe's award-winning Great Divide team, which investigates educational inequities in Boston and throughout the state. Prior to joining The Globe in 2021, she spent more than 20 years as a reporter and editor at the Austin American Statesman. Melissa, thank you for making time for EWA Radio. Oh, thanks for the invite. Emily, before you do the outro, I, I just wanted to say that I realized in hindsight, you asked me what I'm looking forward to. And it's scrutinizing higher education. That that says a lot about me, I think, in ways that I'm not entirely proud of. <laughs> That's fine, John. Don't worry. I thought you were going to say just a couple of good long runs or bike rides, but you know, <laughs> you, you you do you, John. John Marcus is an education editor and also co-host of the new podcast with GBH Boston and Heckinger Report, College Uncovered. It pulls back the ivy on American higher education and explores how college really works. John, always glad to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. Before we close out this week's episode, we want to take one more look ahead into 2024 to March in Austin, Texas, to be exact. To do that, I want to dial up Casey Fabris, a program manager for EWA and our resident expert on all things South by Southwest EDU. EWA, this is Casey Fabris. Casey, it's Emily. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm getting pretty excited about South by Southwest, EDU in Austin, and I was hoping you could tell EWA radio listeners why they want to be there. Absolutely. So as Emily mentioned, EWA is headed to Austin, Texas for South by Southwest EDU in March, and we're bringing journalists with us. We're offering two strands of programming on critically important topics on the education beat, school finance and student data privacy. We've organized two panel discussions, one of which will be recorded for a special episode of EWA Radio. These are open to all South by Southwest EDU attendees, so be sure to add them to your schedule if you're already registered for the conference. We're also holding private workshops just for our journalist members, but you have to apply to attend those. You can find more information on EWA.org about this program, so I hope to see some of you there. 
That sounds fantastic, Casey. You left out three important words about Austin. What? Word number one, tacos. (laughs) Second two words, live music. Austin is fantastic. Folks, we're going to have a great time at South by Southwest, either you and Austin. It's just a chance to bond with fellow journalists, get to know some new faces, new friends, new sources. We really want to see you there. So stop by EWA.org for more. Thanks for coming in, Casey. Thanks so much for having me. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a reporter or a story you want to learn more about, drop us a line at radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 75 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a good week, have a great new year, and take care of yourselves. Thanks for listening.